Welcome to the Down South Hunting Podcast. I'm Adam Cruz with Mike Higman. We're on the downhill swing here where I'm at in Tennessee of deer season. I know, Mike, you have a little bit of time left. What's hunting season been like for you the last couple of weeks since the last time we talked? Man, it's been pretty quiet. Uh, I got out like a couple quick little squirrel hunts uh, with the kids uh, right around the holidays. Unfortunately, weren't weren't able to seal the deal. I did take my youngest out for about 15 minutes on a quote-unquote deer hunt. Uh, we did, we, we didn't see anything. Um, but it was important to me to try to get some time out with all of my kids. So, um, I knew she'd have the short attention span and we had a little bit of time where I got out on just the edge of some public land, uh, out at my dad's place. And I've got hopefully one more hunt I'm going to be able to get in before the end of the season. I'd like to get another doe for the freezer and I've got one daughter left that I haven't been able to take with me yet and have promised to take her. So the plan is to get one more hunt in with the rifle, hopefully put a doe down and uh, put some more meat in the freezer. What about you? Well, I think officially my deer season is probably over. I don't think that I'll be able to get out any in the next few days. Um, uh. Over the holidays, uh, my family got hit by the stomach flu. One by one, we each fell. Then we got hit with colds. My wife's pregnant. Man, I got tons of excuses of why I didn't get to hunt very much. But I did make one more trip to Kentucky. Um, got up there right as that big cold front pushed through. And, I mean, it was probably, I think it was about 15 degrees when I got there, about 1 o'clock. Um, this place hunts thousands of acres. Uh, driving through the WMA, and I don't see a single truck. I'm super excited because the last time I was there, you know, the place was covered up. I get down to where I want to hunt, and sure enough, there's some dude walking around in civilian clothes in the middle of these fields where I want to enter in. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up going back to where I'd shot and and missed the deer earlier in the season and and didn't see a thing. So, you know, it was uh. A heck of a deer season. I had a lot of lessons that I have learned along the way, and I hope to fix some of those in the off season. I'm actually probably more excited about the postseason than I was the deer season, just because I've been aching to get into some places that I couldn't really. I knew I would be intruding on some people if I was going around scouting, so I'm going to hit those areas up really soon and uh, and get some places lined up for next year. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Um, and it, I'm sorry you weren't able to put any meat in the freezer, but if if I remember right, don't you have like a place where you might be able to hunt a little bit in the off season, just hopefully to put some meat in the freezer? I did put some meat in the freezer. Oh, the, you did with that doe. That's right. <laughs> yeah, God, I, you I, shot a doe. I have a oh, big well, scar. I've got a big scar between my eyes to prove it, man. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but yeah, we do have a possibility of getting um, the depredation. Uh, tags from that homeowner and there is a doe only season going on right now but i'd basically have to take off some time to work to get there before it closes on saturday i'm not going to do that so yeah who knows we'll see if the landowner uh, follows through and, and get some nuisance tags and that would be cool but i'm not going to hold my breath for that that's for sure well and you got to save that vacation time for you know one of your favorite times of year coming up right turkey season or my baby birth of my baby which other one <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, your wife should have a handle by now, right? You already got three kids. I mean, yeah, I think she's got it taken care of. I mean, what's a maybe four or five days turkey hunting going to hurt anything? Uh, I mean, I I think you ought to just get out of her hair, really. I mean, <laughs> I'll bring my mom up here. That'll work great. Yeah. I'm joking, mom. Joking, baby. Don't get mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's let's be serious. Uh, you know, we joked around. Our moms and wives do not listen to this. So No. We should be on safe ground here. My wife never reads my blog posts, but she always likes them, and it aggravates me so much. I'm like, why <laughs> are you liking it if you don't read it? Can you at least read it? I, I appreciate your wife's support on social media. My wife hasn't hasn't given us a single like, so uh, I, can, I can appreciate that. <laughs> she has listened to the podcast a couple of times, so maybe she's listening. Uh, I love you, Christina, if you are listening. Switching gears here to social media, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Facebook group uh, that you started up? Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. So we started a new group, and it's not just down south hunting. It's hunting in the south. 
So if you have any buddies that don't listen to the podcast, uh, make sure you invite them. If you do listen to the podcast, then you should be joining the group. And we are going to be talking about hunting tips and tactics in the South. We're going to be talking about this podcast. We may talk about some other podcasts if they talk about Southern stuff. Um, but basically, we're going to be talking hunting in the South. And one thing I'm really excited about is we're going to do some more reports on, you know, what type of activity is going on. So with turkey season coming up, we're going to be talking about, you know, when they're strutting and gobbling in, in different areas. And when deer season rolls around again, we're going to try to do a rut report. And we've gotten some good feedback from some of you saying, hey, it'd be cool if you guys could do a rut report. And that's not something I think we can cover in the podcast right now. Maybe if we start going to a weekly format, we can we can get that in. And that's something Adam and I have been talking about. But uh, on the Facebook group, we can do rolling reports all the time. So please join in with that. Um, even if it's not something you're active in right now, just join the group and uh, you'll, you'll be getting updates on your feed, hopefully, about what's going on with that. It's called Hunting in the South, and it's sponsored by Down South Hunting. So there should be a link to that on the Down South page if you follow us there as well. Um, there's also a couple other news things I, I want to share with you guys and, and ask for your help with. One thing is if you listen to Spotify, we just got on the Spotify ha app. Uh, so um, if that's something that you're interested in, check us out there. And uh, something I've been following here is on, on iTunes, is, is or now it's called Apple Podcast, is basically the number one place for podcast downloads. So uh, I personally don't use uh, Apple products, but I know most of you listening probably do because that's what the stats are telling me. So if I could ask you a favor, one thing is there's a top 200 podcasts on that, on, on Apple podcasts right now that, that number moves out up and down quite a bit, like where you fall on that right now, we're sitting at 194. And, uh, what I would like to do, I would love to be able to get in that top 100 and I'm going to be watching it. And what I'm asking is if you could just subscribe to the podcast, if you have not done that yet, um, ratings and reviews. I love those two. If you can do that, but uh, just this week, I'm going to give you an update. Next time we do a podcast, I want to see if we can get in the top 100. Uh, just subscribe to the podcast if that's something you haven't done yet. Um, Adam, you got any more updates for us? No, I think that has me up to date. I am looking forward to this unique interview that we have, though. Yeah, I got one last thing. I guess I'm I'm the uh, the guy that's going to be pimping everything this, <laughs> this opening. <laughs> I have nothing else to yeah. pimp. My coffee company yeah. went away. You know, I don't have anything, man. <laughs> yeah, check, check out Chase the Mountain. If you haven't been Chase the Mountain, Adam's posted several new blog posts lately about goals for the year, which I think are are worthwhile reads. Um, ChaseTheMountain.com. And, uh, of course, HuntingGearDeals.com, our number one sponsor from the beginning. Uh, make sure you guys are checking that. Uh, the end of the year here is coming, and as the season rolls up, there's going to be a lot of different websites that are going to be clearing out a lot of their old inventory, especially with ATA going on now, they're going to be announcing new products. So there should be a lot of sales in the next two to three weeks, I'd say. And, uh, you know, once that, that gets around, you know, there was going to be a little bit of lull before we get to Turkey season, but just these next couple of weeks, check it out, check it out every day. And I'll be updating with the different stuff that's getting cleared out by these stores. All right. With that, let's get Kyle Bennett on the line. All right. I'm excited about it. Tonight we have on the phone Kyle Bennett from Louisiana. Mike and I had the pleasure of meeting Kyle at the QDMA convention in New Orleans this past year. And after that meeting, we had the idea to bring Kyle on to discuss Mississippi whitetails and uh, what it takes to help at a local QDMA branch. Kyle, we appreciate you taking the time to come on with us tonight. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, we're glad you joined. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your uh, position at the local QDMA branch? Uh, sure thing. So uh, I grew up, born and raised in southwest Louisiana. Uh, still live there today. Uh, I'm an architect, and I'm a lifelong hunter, fisherman, uh, archery enthusiast, habitat manager, pretty much anything that has to do with the outdoors. I'm real heavily involved in a lot of outdoor conservation groups, uh, mainly the Quality Deer Management Association, or QDMA. Um, 
and I serve uh, QDMA as the branch president for the Southwest Louisiana branch. How has your deer season went up to this point? Well, uh, to be honest, it has been a rough season. Uh, it's, it's been kind of an odd season for me. Um, I hunt primarily in Mississippi. We have uh, a family farm in uh, southwest Mississippi, north of Natchez, in the hills off of the Mississippi River. Uh, and that's where I do the majority of my deer hunting. And uh, because of my job this year, I've had a lot of big projects to manage and i have missed quite a bit of weekends deer hunting um i got to hunt a little bit early season and uh, after that it was it was kind of kind of patchy for about two months and and just now around the holidays i've kind of picked back up and, and gotten hunt a little bit so it has it, it's been rough you know i i'm used to killing uh you know four or five deer per season and uh this year i have yet to harvest a deer in uh three months out of four months of the season so i'm i'm just chalking it up to uh to this year is uh keeping my sense of self-worth as getting uh too high you know don't want to stay stay (laughs) low-key i think we all have those seasons where (laughs) we're kind of up and down how much uh, how much season do you have left there uh our season will end january 31st okay so you're not, are you not in the area that's got the late rut then? No, we are actually. Our, our rut uh, typically peaks uh, around the first week of January. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Christmas, Christmas, New Year's time frame is, is really our, uh, our best week of the season, our best couple of weeks of the season. So we're, we're just now coming down out of that. Uh, in fact, I hunted uh, – five or six days in a row after Christmas and, uh, and didn't do much to speak of, unfortunately. <laughs> Saw a few bucks, uh, cruising, chasing, but, uh, overall not a lot of deer activity, which is kind of out of the ordinary, but I guess it's just in line with the rest of the season. Yeah. Well, the, you might have a couple good weekends left in either, right? Right. Right. And, uh, the, the last few weekends of January are always great too, because they really start hitting the food sources hard again once the rut kind of peters down. So can you tell us a little bit more about that, the property that you hunt as far as like what the size is and how it sets up? Sure. So, um, so this is, uh, uh, 400 acres, uh, that my family owns and, uh, we purchased it in 2012. And it was originally, it's surrounded by a hunting club that uh, my dad and I have been members of for about 20, 20 or 21 years. So I essentially spent most of my life hunting over there. Uh, the property that we own is, uh, it's got a great mix of habitat. It's very diverse. Um, it had uh, originally had a lot of mature pine. And a lot of topography, the topography changes, you know, 150 to 175 feet in some places. It's pretty intense. Uh, but mainly it's ridges that drop off into big hardwood bottoms. And we've got a substantial creek that runs through it. Uh, the creeks in that part of Mississippi, because of topography, they're a road. So they're pretty deep. They're more like ravines. This one is probably 50 or 60 deep, 50 or 60 feet deep uh, on the banks. But um so uh and, and this property also it's got some upland hardwoods and then it, it's got some got some bottomland hardwoods and it's got some uh some fat flat pine plantation and it's also got some rolling pine plantation so it's got a lot of habitat diversity and uh we, we've done a substantial amount of habitat work to it um as far as putting in some clear cuts to increase some of the some of the thicket early successional cover we've done a lot of uh thin stands of pine and uh, set those up to do prescribed burns and we put in uh we have about 12 acres of food plots uh that we we keep planted pretty much year round so how do you usually hunt that between i guess between you and your family do you guys have a lot of preset stands and shooting houses or do you like to move around yeah um you know, we have quite a bit permanent stands. That's, that's, you know, one of the, one of the uh, great things about having your own property or your own lease property. Um, we're able to do a lot of scouting beforehand and hang these stands. 
we have uh, probably probably 25 or 30 bow stands. Uh, and then each food plot, I think we have we have uh, 10 food plots, I think, and each one has a, has a shooting house, like a box on it. But my dad and I are the main ones who hunt the property, and we pretty much just bow hunt. So we, we only bring out a rifle very rarely at the end of the season when we uh, need to take a few more does off the farm. Okay. Sounds like a pretty cool piece. What about uh, the land around it? You said you used to be on a lease there. Is that still, you still right. on it, that club? It, or? R- right. It, it is, uh, it's, we're still members of the club. We still hunt there sometimes too. We just kind of have our own piece that we can, uh, you know, manage and do what we want. You know, the rest of it is lease property. So we are, we are, uh, can't do a lot of manipulation and stuff to the land. It's still great habitat and we take some great bucks off of it. Uh, it's a real interesting area that that whole area where uh, the club is and also where our private property is, is is part of an old cotton plantation and uh actually there's a there's a 200 and something year old uh plantation house and uh the farmer it's it's his family that owns it the farmer still lives there and he still grows cotton today wow pretty neat yeah, that's a pretty cool area, sounds like. Did, did you happen to catch our last episode with Brian Landry? I did, yes. Is that, the, like, a, it sounds like a lot of the, the the hills and that kind of stuff is real similar. Is that, are you in the same area as he is? Correct. I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the, the refuge he was hunting, although I have a pretty good idea, and if so, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're fairly close. <laughs> that might have been intentional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's pretty cool. Um, so, uh what is your typical strategy like through the season then? Are you guys usually trying to hunt uh, the food plots for the most part? Or are you trying to hunt between the food plots and bedding? How, how do you usually set that up? Well, uh, that r- really depends on what point in the season, you know, kind of where we're at. Uh, our, because of our late rut, we have these kind of weird seasonal blocks in Mississippi compared to other parts of the country. Um, you know, our season opens October 1, bow season, and uh, pre-season or early season is pretty much um, October and November. And, uh, you know, where typically the rest of the country is getting ramped up around Halloween to go hunt the rut. I mean, we're not even thinking about it yet. So uh, we, we really key on uh, uh, um, food plots and a lot of native er- uh, food sources in the early season. Um, you can be really successful on a mature buck early in the year. I've done it several times, uh, either patterning them on a food plot and being successful in the late evening or hunting stuff like uh, we have, you know, native persimmon. We have a lot of native honey locusts, which is a huge food source in that part of the country. Uh, so early in the season, I'm, I'm focusing on food. I, I, uh, I actually don't hunt a lot in the mornings during that time. I, I do some if the weather cools off, but for the most part, it's just not worth it um, to go and sweat all morning and add a lot of pressure and have a, a low impact hunt uh, or a low percentage hunt, excuse me. So I try to focus on the evenings. And as we, uh, as we get into a little bit cooler months and stuff in November, I'll stay on the food plots and I may start hunting some, uh, some mash trees. We have a lot, lots of different species of acorns, especially white oaks and, swamp chestnuts which are like white oak acorns on steroids i don't know if y'all are familiar with those yeah um yeah they're great they're, yeah. they're giant and the, the deer hammer them we have quite a few of those and that's uh late october early november that's a great place to be sitting in a stand um after that i'll, I'll try to move uh, in the morning i'll start to hunt some uh, travel corridors and uh once we once we kind of get closer to the rut uh, which will be late November or no, excuse me, like, uh, mid December or so. Um, I'll start hunting, uh, a lot of times on the, uh, on the fringes of, of some of our bedding areas or anywhere where I could find like a pinch point or funnel. Now, you know, we're in a big woods area. We're in the hills. There's, relatively no ag just a little tiny bit of ag and 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 except for food plots and roads everything else is forested so it's kind of hard to predict deer movement sometimes even with the topography 
so that can be a challenge and especially coming as a you know a strict bow hunter so to speak there's a lot of opportunities that we just have to let go because you know we may we may see a lot of big bucks but uh you can't really shoot them with a bow at 100 yards so <laughs> you got to get to that point where you can really narrow down exactly where they're moving and that can be difficult but uh if you can do it you can capitalize on it <clears throat> are you uh, so Sorry about that, Kyle. Uh, no, I was going to ask if you were moving your stands throughout the year uh, based off of deer bedding. Or you, were you setting up um, permanent stands off historical bedding? No. So we have permanent stands, and we leave those in place. And those are permanent stands because they are in a good spot. And uh, we rotate the pressure on them. We, we really try not to pressure them too much. And, uh, so what I do do is I have, uh, I have multiple climber stands and I have some lock-ons and, and if I want to be mobile, I'm taking some of those and, uh, I will move, I will move depending on what's going on in the woods and what time of year it is. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of hanging hunts because, um, you know, we're in the South and we've got all the straight pine trees we can, you know, for our heart's desire that are perfect for a climber stand. And, uh, it's a lot easier to just shimmy up a tree and hunt. So I will definitely move in mobily, uh, any chance I get. Um, but, uh, it, it just depends on what's going on and what time of year it is on where that is. I, I like to typically hunt a uh, hundred yards or so downwind of, of a, of a doe bedding area and on our property we have uh, some big sanctuary set up in the middle where we did some clear cuts and some early successional cover that's real real thick and uh that's where the majority of our deer bed and so it's it's pretty easy to uh to find the spot to be <clears throat> what kind of climber are you running uh i have an old i have several old man climbers um uh, my favorite is the drone, which is actually, I think they're not in production anymore, but I've been using it for a couple of seasons now. I really like it. Uh, it's, it's fairly light. It's not the lightest one, but, uh, it's got a lot of nice features and it's, it's pretty sturdy. Uh, I, I like it quite a bit and I actually run it opposite of, of how you think you're supposed to run it. Uh, I actually like to climb and face the tree. Um, I found that it's more, way more comfortable to me. You know, most people, most people climb facing the tree, but then they turn and they face out. Well, I leave the, the seat, uh, slid to the front of the stand so I can sit on it that way. And I, I can actually lean in toward the tree and also use the tree to, to hide my silhouette. It, it works pretty well, but, uh, it's, it's a pretty good setup. Is that what, that one's got one of the mesh seats? Right. It's got the mesh seat, which, I mean, to me, that's as comfortable as you can get. <laughs> yeah, it is nice if you're leaving that out overnight, too. You're not coming back to sit in a wet seat. Definitely, definitely. Earlier, you were talking about the early season and the transition um, off of food. You know, where I'm hunting at, it's uh, late September. It seems like our, our deer are making a, a summer transition uh, around the late September, early October. They kind of change up. Uh, their home range, so to speak. It's and you saying yours is like that late October to early November. Is that about where that transition occurred? Right. You know, our our deer or our bucks shed velvet the same time all the other bucks in the country shed velvet. Um, but they're kind of still hanging around on on that late summer pattern, and and sometimes it can persist into uh, early November. Uh, it just kind of depends on the individual deer and how much pressure you're putting on them. Um, if you can kind of, if you can keep human presence down as much as possible, you can keep them coming into some of those food plots during daylight. It's, it's tough, but it happens, especially when the weather's, if you get a little cool snap, an early cool snap. But, uh, uh, I've been lucky enough to, to capitalize that on, on a couple of bucks, but, uh, it's, uh, doesn't happen often. It's, it's not a science. That's for sure. It, it's mostly luck. <laughs> I'm going to take a little poll here since Mike's also in the deep South. Are your deer doing the same thing about the same, same time frame of transition? Um, as far as moving from like food to rut? Well, yeah. Moving from just like their summer range to say like the fall, fall range. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it really depends on when, when the rut is. So like based like here in Florida, 
it kind of depends on like what part of Florida we're talking about here. So the, the property I hunted this year probably was, I would say, the middle of August. I mean, the middle of October. Um, you know, the rut was more towards the middle to the end of November where I was hunting this year. Um, but uh, the place I hunted last year, the rut is like the middle of October. So basically, as soon as season's open, is right around uh, when when those bachelor groups are breaking up and they're you know getting hard horned and all that. So I guess it kind of depends. Yeah, I've I've actually killed a, a decent buck in a bachelor group on like October twenty sixth or twenty seventh, like right before Halloween one year. <laughs> That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. Do you guys run trail cameras to keep track of all this activity? Yes, I am a uh, I'm a trail cam nut. We have quite a few of them uh, that I keep running, and uh, you know the big thing for us. I live in Southwest Louisiana. My farm is in Southwest Mississippi, and I do primarily all of my home hunting. That's my home farm, so to speak, where I do all my hunting pretty much, and uh, it's four hours away from where I live, which is a, a huge oh, yeah. pain in the butt, uh, but. You know, I've been doing it my whole life. I'm used to pack it up Friday after work or after school and run to the camp and staying there all weekend and coming home on Sunday ready for work or school again on Monday. So uh, trail cameras to me are huge because I, I just can't be there all the time. And uh, I need that, you know, most recent information to, to kind of keep in check of what's going on. I've hunted there for so long. I kind of know generally what's happening as far as, as movement goes, but. Uh, as far as keeping tabs on individual deer and and, uh, and stuff like that, you know, what stands are hot and when, uh, the trail cameras are essential. Plus, it's just tons and tons and tons of fun to uh, look at pictures. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, like a mini set of hunting within hunting. Like, if you get a picture of a good buck, you know, your camera placement was correct. You did a lot of things right to get that. So, uh it can help you pick stands. Um, I mean, there's there's millions of uses. I, I love them. My wife has told me several times if just getting the deer, a picture of a deer, was <laughs> all it took to hunting, I'd be a great hunter. But right, right. Seems to be I think that applies to everybody. Pictures of them shoot them. <laughs> we really should get our wives Same together sometime. Uh, yeah, that might be bad news. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Adam, I know you had some questions about QDMA. Yeah, um, let, let's have, let's stay on the the hunting topic right now. I mean, we're getting close to or, or do that or yeah. <laughs> or I've got some, some more. I think I think let's transition into the postseason scouting. That's um, a very professional tra- transition. Right? I was just, I'm totally trying to set them up, man. I'm just trying to let you knock it down, but you know, I, I'm getting to edit this one, so I get to do what I want. I'll just cut this out. So there you, go. <laughs> uh, you know, we both know you're not going to edit this out. Uh, yeah, it's probably true. Um, anyways, we are getting close to the end of your season, Kyle. My season will end on Friday, and what's on my mind is postseason scouting. I mean, I try to do it as soon as the season's over. I'm excited about what's going on in my life and my world. I'm sure you got plenty to, to say about what your plans are for postseason scouting. Could you kind of run us uh, through – your postseason scouting regimen, what you're looking for, what you're doing, what's your off season plans? Absolutely. So uh the good thing, we've got a couple couple more weeks to hunt, but uh the great thing is this time of year they typically hit the food sources uh hard again and a lot of times during daylight. So uh you know once that once that kind of wraps up and the season's over, um I'm going to, I'm going to get in the woods as much as possible. You know, you've heard it time and again, this is, this is really the best time to scout because the deer are, are still on a, their winter type pattern. You know, they're doing the same thing they did three days ago when it was deer season. Uh, so I, you know, I get in the woods and I start looking for sign one. I'm, I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking, I'm walking trails. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where they're, where they're coming from, where they're bedded. Um, I'm looking for deer beds. You know, it, it, it's pretty pretty crazy where we're at. Since since essentially everything is woods, it can be pretty hard to to determine where the deer are bedding sometimes. And, and even though we have 
we have areas that we have, you know, manipulated and created that are prime for deer bedding. Uh, you know, some deer will come from there and some deer will come from just some random other spot just where they felt safe to bed down. So I'm just looking for, uh, for anything I can. A, a lot of times at the, at the end of the season or postseason, the does have grouped back up where they were previously busted up during the rut. Now they're back in these big doe groups. They're bedding in groups, so it's really obvious of, of what's a doe, what's a doe bed or a group of doe beds, and, and what a buck bed is. Uh, it's really interesting on, on our property or kind of the area we in. I told you a few minutes ago about these creeks that we have, and because of the composition of the soil and the way things erode, they're I mean they're like ravines or they're like canyons. I mean they drop way down, <clears throat> even if they have only a little bit of water in. So. Uh, what I have found over the years, a lot of deer will bed along these creeks, even if it's wide open. I mean, it may be, uh, it may be complete closed canopy hardwoods and you can see for 250 yards, but the deer feel comfortable bedding on the edge of these creeks because they know if they, if they lay with their back to the creek, nothing can get to them from that direction. And they can look out on these hardwood flats and see everything that's going on. And especially if they use that with the wind to their advantage. Um, where they can also smell behind them too. But so I find quite a few beds along these creeks. And, and what's really cool also is over the years, I found multiple beds, which are, you know, I assume are buck beds on these islands in the creek. And uh, I found one specifically last year on our property in a little area I hadn't been in before. And there was a section where the creek split and went around and then joined back on the other side. And it actually created like an Island in the middle of the Creek where it dropped off 40, 50 feet on each side. And I found a spot where the deer were coming up out of the Creek and coming up the side of this thing. And, and there was the most perfect deer bed on the edge of this thing, looking out across this big flat. And it was under this big, huge old overgrown Magnolia tree. And I was just thinking, man, if I was a big, big booner mississippi deer i would be laying right here and uh you know it's stuff like that that you find in late season because if, if you get there and you know when when everything's green and leafy it's just really hard to find that stuff sometimes uh but anyways uh postseason postseason is really the best time to find sign in my opinion that relates to hunting and so i try to get out as much as i can and, uh, and, and also this is the type of time of year where we really get into the habitat management stuff. So we're usually on the property quite a bit this time of year. Have you guys gotten involved at all in, in doing like hinge cutting and laying logs out and that kind of stuff to create deer beds? <laughs> no, I, I have, I've looked at it. I've never really balled into that completely. I mean, I know a lot of these guys have seen some success, but, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, just huge areas where we've done, we've done our own timber stand improvement, or we've done a lot of what we call bedding areas, uh, or what we call our, our sanctuary areas, our clear cuts, where we've gone in and completely cut everything was there and did not replant in pine. So it's, it's pretty much just regenerated in natural vegetation. Uh, and that stuff is so thick. I mean, you can't walk through it. It's, it's not possible. Um, so that is what we have done essentially to create beds, giving them these giant thickets that they can go hide in, uh, but not so much the, you know, the sweeping the ground out of all the rocks and, and uh, you know, fluffing the pillows, so to speak. And even though <laughs> that stuff really is neat, but uh, I have not, have not done it. I, I think I got to agree with you there. I think in the South for in general, we have such a long growing season there's not like a lack of cover in most areas anyway. So the idea of creating more cover mm -hmm. to hold deer really isn't necessary in a lot of properties, unless maybe it's all, you know, a mature, you know, pine stands or something like that. For the most right. part, and, and, there's plenty of bed. The, right. And the hinge cutting there, there is definitely some benefit in that. You know, one problem we deal with quite a bit is, uh, is are these closed canopy hardwoods and, uh, you know, a lot of times the trees will be mature and they'll be way too big and you'll have a lot of understory trees that are kind of blocking out what remains of the sunlight that's getting through these big canopies. So, uh, I have gone in and, and done that a little bit, 
specifically with like um we have a lot of ash trees in my part of the woods and uh those things hinge cut pretty well and, and, and there are multiple other species but mostly i use hinge cutting uh to to navigate deer or to to move them in a certain direction to, or to funnel them if i want them to come out into a specific spot in a food plot or if i want them want to try to force them to go within bow range of a stand that's 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 typically what i do what i do with hinge cutting i'm sure you you've listened to the msu deer lab podcast as well and have heard right. uh mark what marcus lashley has to say are you going to try any of these mineral stumps that kind of are the new idea you, you know i i've actually it's funny i've actually done that before quite a bit and uh and and ash is one of those that he actually talked about if i remember correctly but um green ash or it, it is not or ironwood um they're not something that you would really see as an ideal deer species, but just like a lot of other, other species of trees, the, the deer will hammer those shoots when they pop up. <clears throat> so I've been cutting those trees down for a long time just to get them out of the way. So inadvertently <laughs> creating mineral stuff. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that's kind of where some of the idea they had came from is just seeing deer respond to where they had cut those trees down. Right. Right. Well, changing gears a little bit, I've been following you on social media for the past few months and saw that you were in Missouri not too long ago hunting some public land. So I was going to just kind of inquire and see how many different states that you've hunted uh, doing DIY whitetail hunts and maybe what your favorite state was that you've hunted. Right. Uh, we went to Missouri this year. Um, that was a great hunt. I went with a, a group of buddies, actually, some of my some of my QDMA branch committee. Uh, we went this year. We had a, a, a decent amount of luck. It was a, an archery only piece up in north northern Missouri, and uh, there were four of us hunting. We hunted for a week, and uh, one of the guys killed a nice buck uh, toward the end of the week, and, and a few other guys killed those. Um, I actually had opportunities at, at several of those that I passed up on just because of, of how far we were hiking back into these spots. And, uh, you know, just the fact that I had some of these deer in bow range and, and let them walk, I, you know, I kind of, the way I am and how I hunt, that's a, that's a success to me. So I, I was there looking for a buck and, um, uh, I had a great, great trip, great time, always fun to go hunt public land when you're friends. So, but uh, as far as the states I've hunted, let's see, do uh, you want this season or, or historically? Uh, just historically. Okay. Uh, so DIY, this, this was kind of my first big DIY out-of-state hunt. Now, I have hunted several other states for whitetail. Um, hunted Texas. I've hunted my home state, Louisiana. I've hunted Mississippi uh, and hunted in Iowa. And uh, Iowa is by far the best place I've ever hunted. I mean, uh, that place is amazing. <laughs> did you have some private land up there, or how you, or did you go with an outfitter? Yeah, <clears throat> no, uh, I'm I'm not real big in the in the outfitting game, but uh, fortunate enough that a, a close family friend of mine, who's who's kind of a mentor, um, he has a private farm up there, and and does a lot of the habitat management stuff and a lot of the, the quality deer management and he's who i've learned quite a bit from over the years since i was a, a small child and uh, he invited us up or actually several years in advance because it, it takes about four years to draw an iowa tag uh his farm is, is right across the missouri border in southern iowa and uh he's got about uh got about 300 acres or so so we went up there and hunted with them for a week in uh 2015 and it was, it, I was in heaven. I mean, it was like the time of my life. There, there were big deer everywhere. Uh, something we're not used to in, in South Mississippi. <laughs> Behind every tree, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. I mean, we do get some, some pretty big deer in my part of Mississippi compared to the rest of the South, but uh, there's nothing like, like Iowa. Or, or, I mean, most of the Midwest in general. I mean, they're just so visible and and they do what they're supposed to do is the main thing. So, uh, 
uh, I had a blast. I ended up taking a, a great 150-inch. Uh, uh, it was an eight-point uh, toward the end of my hunt on November 11th. Um, he was about nine years old. He was an incredibly old buck that they'd had on camera for a while. And um, actually, it, it's it's a funny story, but the uh, the guy I was hunting with, we were calling Doc. Um, it was his farm and he and I were actually hunting together on the evening that I harvested it. So it was a nice, nice memory to have. <clears throat> That's an old deer. That is awesome. Yeah. He was incredibly old and, uh, it was, it was great, great hunt. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into this QDMA discussion. Um, tell us why someone should not only join QDMA, but why they should get plugged into their local branch. Yeah. Um, you know, for somebody like me, um, QDMA was, was really important because it, it got me connected to a lot of people who think similarly as I do. You know, I'm, I'm from the deep South. I'm from a small rural town, a little small area. So I know tons of people who hunt, like most people I know hunt, but, uh, not many people hunt and think about hunting and think about wildlife management kind of to the degree that I do. I mean, I'm completely ate up with it. Like I, I eat, sleep, breathe it. And, uh, you know, honestly, most people just can't hang at that level where, where I'm at. I mean, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost so into it that it's, it comes out of fault. Uh, you know, like, you know, I may meet somebody out and they mentioned they like deer hunting to me and 10 minutes later in the conversation, conversation i'm talking about the difference between crimson clover and red clover and my favorite rare, rare varieties of pear trees that i'm grafting and planting on our property and i'm so way over their head like i've lost them but the good thing about qdma is you know qdma is for people who are looking to you know educate themselves and improve the resources that they have and so naturally it's exactly where you meet people like that and, uh, you know, people who are like-minded and, and, and think about things similarly. So I've met a lot of great friends through QDMA, met a lot of great people and, and, and people I can bounce ideas off of and people who are doing the same things as I'm doing on my property and people who are doing different things than I'm doing on my property. And I'm able to talk with them and, and get some criticism or get some, some new ideas, um, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Another, another great reason especially to get plugged in with a local branch uh, is it's great. And, and it's great. Like through QDMA to meet people who are doing the same stuff you are, but in different parts of the country and you can kind of get that different perspective. But with a local branch, you're meeting people who are doing the same thing you are, but in the same part of the country. So that's even more helpful because y'all are dealing with the same, the same uh, problems. I mean, uh, you know, the same, same type of habitat, the same, maybe even the same neighbors, same landowners, the same, you know, government entities, all kinds of stuff like that. So as far as, uh, as far as meeting people with the same type of mindset, QDMA is just, it's ideal. And it, it's been great for me personally. You talked about that education piece. Um, I'm a member of QDMA and I've, you know, I've learned a lot, especially going to the QDMA convention. They have one of the best magazines that's out there, but the education piece that you speak, you're speaking to, is that mostly at the local level uh, that you're, you're gathering more information than you normally would? Right. So, um, I mean, QD May in general has, just like you said, they put out some fantastic information, uh, you, you know, that draw on all kinds of research projects from different universities, a lot of the top universities, top biologists in the country. You know, everything that QDMA <clears throat> reports on or, or writes about is, is all science-based management information. Um, but the, the ideal thing about being part of a local branch, like I said, is you get that specific local information uh, that's, that's, you know, specific to your area and, and specific to the people you're dealing with. So from an educational standpoint, um, you know, a lot of the local branches will host, um, field days or have educational seminars. My, my branch, uh, that's something we started doing last year is we host these, uh, 
it's kind of corny, but we call them Bucks and Brews Seminar. We have this big brewery that we go to, and we bring a guest in, and, and he, he gives a, a short seminar, a, a talk about some sort of management-related topic. And the, re- the rest of us, the branch, we sit around, we listen to him, we ask questions, we drink a lot of beer, we eat a lot of pizza, we have a good time. Uh, so, you know, that's that's one of the big benefits and as far as being a part of a local branch and, and the educational opportunities. And, and everything that we talk about in those is, is specific to the area where we're at and, and is relevant information to the people who, who come out and want to learn something specifically about where they're hunting. What is what's it like being a member of a local branch as far as like the time commitment, how often you guys meet, uh, what's it cost, that kind of stuff? Right. So um, it doesn't cost anything. Um, you know, it, it, there is a there is a membership fee uh, to be a, for anyone to be a part of QDMA. Um, I think it's thirty five dollars a year unless you sign up for multiple years at a time. Uh, but really, it. it, it as far as time's concerned, it's as much as you want to put into it or not put into it. Um, you know, I'm, my case is a little bit different cause I'm a branch president. And so, uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, managing what's going on and managing my committee members and, and, and yes, planning for events, uh, can be stressful and hectic, but, uh, it's all, all enjoyable. I mean, it's all worth it. Um, you know, we meet, we try to meet about once a month or so, uh, maybe once every two months if, if there's not much going on. Uh, but this time of year with, with deer season going on, we're, we're all kind of taking a break and, uh, and focusing on hunting. But as soon as the season's over, we'll pick back up and, and start planning for our spring banquet. And then, uh, some educational, we're going to pick up some more seminar stuff. And then in the summertime, we'll be getting ready for a convention and, and uh, everything that goes into that. Do you guys do much volunteer work in the community? Yeah, we do some. Uh, my branch is, is a relatively new branch, and we're still growing quite a bit. Um, you know, one thing one thing we've been doing is, is trying to get more involved with, with the youth. Um, we've donated uh, uh, resources and... Uh, and stuff like that to uh to some of the youth like uh archery clubs <clears throat> stuff like that over the years and uh we're hoping to move forward in the next year or two and, and start focusing more on mentoring youth and bringing youth hunting um, that's one of our big focuses for my branch specifically um qdma overall the you know the whole national entity I don't know if, if y'all have looked at the five-year plan for what QDMA has got going on the next five years or the five-year goals that they're trying to meet. But one of the big ones uh, that they're trying to do is, uh, is focus more on uh, bringing in new hunters, um, you know, introducing new hunters to hunting. And that doesn't necessarily mean youth. That's, that could be anyone who's just a new hunter who's inexperienced. And uh, that's one thing I've tried to do personally is is try to mentor, so to speak, uh, as many new hunters as I can. And, and some of those, some of it has been children, and some of it has been buddies of mine that I've known for a long time who have just never really had someone to take them hunting before. So uh, I've done that. In fact, one, one of my good friends, uh, I took him last year and to our farm in Mississippi and helped him kill his first deer. He was he was uh, 28 years old. And, uh, you know, I had more fun with that than I had, uh, had killing a deer myself. So, um, I, I think that's a, that's a big thing that QDMA does and, uh, and, and anyone who's interested in, in doing that should definitely get involved. I know new hunter recruitment's a big deal right now just because of the decline in, in the number of hunters that we have. These older hunters, let's say like your buddy that's 28 years old, is it sticking? Like, is, is he getting engaged with hunting? Is, you know, is he becoming passionate about it and continuing to hunt? Or is it one of those things where he kind of has uh, dropped off? I've, I've tried to introduce him to some of my friends. This is why I'm asking. And it just hasn't stuck, even though like putting him on deer, maybe shoot a deer, but it, it just has not stuck and something they wanted to stick with. And it usually goes back to like lack of access and, and things of that nature. 
Right. Well, for uh, for me uh, and this, this friend in particular, he's uh, he's gotten completely eaten up with it, and his circumstance is a little different. He's been hunting some in the past when he was younger, not a, not a lot when he was real young, but, at, you know, through his teens and, um, and in college years, he would go and never had a good place to go. Never, never even saw a deer, uh, I think and, until I brought him hunting on my farm. But, um, since then he's gotten completely eaten up with it. He, he, uh, he just called me the other day and wanted to know what climbing stand he needed to get and all the ins and outs of, of of how much they weigh and all kinds of, you know, how he's going to be carrying such and such into the woods. And, and, uh, you know, he's really fired up about it. So I'm hoping that will continue to spread. And, and the same with some of the other hunters I bring, um, I like to see that, that fire kind of ignite in them. And, and hopefully, hopefully all the QDMA members who are mentoring new hunters, um, you know, those new hunters that we're mentoring will hopefully mentor new people themselves and it will continue to spread because if we don't, I mean, we're, like you said, we're facing a decline right now. It's, it's, it's apparent. I forgot exactly what the, uh, what the statistic was, but, uh, um, it's not good. It's not a good outlook for us. No, not at all. Adam, one thing is, you know, your buddies that don't stick into it, mm -hmm. I still think it's good to bring people into it because I think most of those people are going to be an advocate for hunting for the rest of their lives, whether they continue to do it themselves or not. So, Oh, yeah, um, 100%. I feel like it's either in somebody or it's not, and if it's not in them, it's, you know, it doesn't hurt just to introduce it to them and, and uh, you know, whether they like it or not, they're going to they're gonna hopefully be an advocate for hunting, which is, is what we're going to need in the current political climate. Yeah, especially if you show them a good experience, it's ethical experience. I've talked about it with like my oldest son. I'm not really sure hunting is going to catch on with him, but you know, doggone it, I'm going to take him a few times and I'm going to have a little bit of fun, make it fun, and no doubt later on in life he'll be an advocate of uh, of hunting. So I think that's the goal. Yeah, right. And so, <clears throat> that's the focus, especially when they're younger. It's just, it's, you know, show them a good time. You know, make it make it a fun experience. Even even if it's at risk of having a bad hunt, because uh, that's what you want them to remember. Not that they froze and they had to be dead quiet for three hours and uh, and didn't see anything. You know what I mean? You know what though? <laughs> we tell people that, but I think back to all the all of my friends, even like my dad. My dad will talk about you know when my granddad took him hunting for the first time. He dropped him off on some ridge and said do not move like don't leave this tree <laughs> don't move nothing and he said that he left in there till like noon just freezing hungry miserable <laughs> and it yep. seems like the people that i talk to with similar circumstances it, it seems like hunting kind of stuck for them for whatever reason i don't know if it's like that discipline uh or maybe it's just a different generation altogether but i, I thought that was it'd uh, be um, uh, that's how i how I learned as well. Well, I mean, when I was young, my, of course, my dad went with me and, and you know mentored me. But uh, when I started bow hunting, I remember him uh, bringing me to the stand, strapping me in, making sure I was there, and I was not allowed to move anywhere until he got back after dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kyle, hopefully, we've got some listeners listening to the podcast that are maybe new to hunting, or or maybe even some some people that haven't even gotten into it yet but are interested it seems like just showing up at a branch meeting like this might be kind of intimidating but it also seems like it might be a good place to get plugged in with some experienced hunters and that kind of stuff so um is that a good place for a new hunter to just basically show up to and if they do i mean how would you recommend that should they call somebody first or just show up to a meeting what's the best way to do that yeah so you know uh QDMA on their website, they have a, uh, they have a branch directory and anybody can go on and look at, uh, all the local branches for, for whatever state. And there's a contact information. Um, you know, I, I get contacted all the time with people who, who've gone on the website and are curious about what we're doing and, and didn't know we had a branch in the area or had heard of QDMA and was looking for somebody to, 
to consult on or to get some advice on some stuff they wanted to do on their property. And they, you know, came across my information, did that. But the first thing you need to do, if you're interested, if you're a new hunter and, and you're interested in getting involved in QDMA, uh, even like you said, even if you're just looking for someone to mentor you or to give you advice and to teach you more about hunting, uh, you know, get on, get on there and, and get with, uh, get with the branch president, you know, any good branch president or anyone who's, who's willing to, to be in charge of a QDMA branch is somebody who's willing to help somebody like that out. And even if they, even if they can't, for whatever reason, they'll put you in contact with someone who can. And during the summertime, we talked about, uh, deer, the deer stewardship program with Lindsay Thomas, uh, of QDMA. And before the podcast, I'd asked you if you went through that and you said, yeah, you were a level two. Could you tell us a little bit about your personal experience going through the deer stewardship program at QDMA? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the deer steward pr- program, uh, for those of you who don't know, in my opinion, it, it's probably the best or one of the best things that QDMA does. The deer steward program is essentially a certification program that anyone can go through. And it teaches you all the ins and outs about white-tailed deer, biology, uh, you know, a little bit about hunting, but mostly it's about habitat and about improving property and, and about the deer themselves. Um, I've gone through level one and level two. Level one, I went through the online version, which uh, anybody can do with a computer. Uh, you watch a series of seminars, and the seminars are given by – some of the QDMA staff and others, some of the top whitetail biologists in the country. Um, you know, you can take notes and you learn all kinds of stuff. And at the end, you take some exams and you pass and you're, you're a level one steward. Level one is kind of like a broad spectrum view of whitetail deer and just really basic uh, habitat. Um, you know, what whitetail deer eat, how they're, how they're, uh, bodies work, how they relate to their environment. And really, in my opinion, anyone who's a serious deer hunter, whether you have property you're trying to manage or not, I mean, you could benefit greatly from going through level one. And like I said, I, it, it's available as an in-person course and also the online course. And the online course for me at that time was, was the best option. For level two, uh, level two is an in cor- in person course only, and for level two, I went uh, in twenty summer of twenty sixteen. Right, summer of twenty sixteen, I went to Cedar Ridge Plantation, which is in South Carolina. Uh, the level two courses are pretty small. I think they take around twenty people a year. Um, usually, there's one or two level two courses each summer, and that was one, honestly, one of the best experiences of my life, really. Um, you know, like we talked about before with just, uh, you know, like-minded people, uh, that's where you really meet like-minded people because, you know, there are not many people who are willing to put forth the kind of, you know, time and resources it takes to go attend one of these classes, uh, unless you're really, really serious about it. So it's just a great time. You're there for, for two or three days. A lot of the QDMA staff and uh, and and top biologists in the country are there too. And you know, for me, I, I was a little a little uh, starstruck, I guess, because you know I've I've read Quality Whitetails magazine for for years since I was young, and have read all kinds of books on the subject. And here I am at Deer Steer Two Course, like sitting around hanging out with a lot of the guys who've wrote these articles or have written these articles and books and uh, you know that that's always cool you know uh, I mean, you know matt ross uh you know joe hamilton cutie may founder uh ryan basinger kip adams craig harper they're all there you know and they're all they're all wealth of knowledge especially craig harper if anyone is uh familiar with craig or not familiar with craig he is like a walking, talking encyclopedia of deer and just any wildlife in general habitat. Um, and he, he's a, he's a great speaker, really, really funny guy to listen to talk. And in fact, I, I would pay him to just read me bedtime stories if he could. Like, I just love <laughs> listening to that guy talk about stuff. <laughs> Adam yeah, and I have been so, talking uh, about Craig actually saying we need to get him on the show. 
Um, and he is, he's fantastic. And, and like I said, an absolute expert, all, all the guys that QD may bring in uh, are, and, and they're all there and they're willing to help you with your own questions, but they've got their own stuff to talk about. So, you know, just like a basic run through, you know, level one is, is really like an overview. Level two is, is kind of like, uh, the meat and potatoes. It's, it's like a, like a hands-on, like how to do some of these things. It's, it's really, really unique. I mean, you get out in the field, in the woods, you know, we were in the woods with Craig one morning cutting down trees, looking at doing a timber stand improvement, how it opened up sunlight in the woods and the species that were on the forest floor. And we looked at some areas. We, I think we were going to do a prescribed burn, but for some reason we couldn't do it. We looked at some areas that had recently been burned. Um, let's see. We, uh, one night we, uh, a, a local biologist had gotten a depredation tag from the, uh, South Carolina game uh, entity. I forgot what they're called exactly, but uh, they got a depredation tag, a specialty tag, and they went out and harvested a deer off of this property that we were at while we were there. They brought it in and Joe Hamilton did a, uh, a necropsy. We actually went, we, we, we broke down the entire deer and looked at, at all the insides and we were looking for uh, diseases and parasites actually. It, that doesn't sound a lot of fun to the to a normal person, but it was it, it was it was a great experience. So, uh, you know, we did that. We looked at uh, we looked at uh, 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 different types of uh, uh, food plots. We we looked at how to uh, how to calibrate uh, sprayers for herbicide. We looked at how to calibrate uh, planters and seed drills. We looked at some of the other equipment. Um, Basically, it, it, it's just a, a really detailed look at all the different aspects of people who are trying to manage property for deer and uh, and the deer themselves. But uh, great, great experience. Uh, had great time, you know, hanging out with these people at night. You get to, you know, drink a beer, sit around the fire and, and talk to some of these people who are just experts and learn from them and, and become friends with them. And uh I mean, just really a great opportunity. I encourage anyone who's interested in uh, in, in in learning more about it to, to check it out. Another cool thing that they're doing now, it, it's also part of the Deer Steward, Deer Steward program, but they call them modules. Uh, and basically what that is, is if, if the Deer Steward Level 2 course is, is a, covers a wide range of topics, the deer steward module covers a really specific topic and it's like two days of nothing but this topic. So I think last year they did a, a predator trapping module. So it was two days uh, on only predator trapping. And then also Craig has a habitat management module, uh, which I've heard is fantastic. I have not been able to go yet, but I'm planning on doing so soon. And so two days of nothing but Craig talking about, different forbs and grasses and how to manage them, uh, how to run a prescribed fire, how to use certain herbicide on what food plot and what early successional cover. I mean, you can't ask for more, for more fun than that. Right. (laughs) Oh man. So, so all this information you just got, we're coming up to the off season, uh, for, for deer season here. What are some of the things that you are going to be taking from these deer steward classes and, and, actually putting into place on the property that you hunt right so uh, you know a lot of this stuff that you learn in deer steward courses and uh, a lot of it I actually uh, I won't say I already knew but I mean it's stuff that I was already actively doing on my own properties and and have been doing since I was younger Uh, you know um, we were really, really intense and serious about our, our wildlife and habitat management. And in fact, that's why we, we, we bought our own property. Uh, so even as a, even as a kid, you know, I, I was, uh, helping to plant food plots and, and stuff like that. So I've kind of grown up in that world. So the deer steward courses were just kind of, uh, going into in deeper about these specific topics, but, um, uh, you know, we, for, for us, when deer season closes and February 1 comes around, that's kind of like uh, the Super Bowl for people who are really, really serious about habitat management. I mean, it's just the best time to get out there and do it. So one thing, you know, 
we're going to be doing a lot of postseason scouting, which we talked about. But now's the best time to uh, to do a lot of a, a lot of work on the property. You know, we're getting ready to do some some prescribed burns on our farm. Um, hopefully, we'll be doing that in in mid February or late February sometime. Um, it's a great great time to plant trees, which I'm I'm also kind of a tree nut. Um, uh, and I plant a lot of trees every year, probably plant 50 to hundred trees every year on my property. Um, and this, this kind of late winter is like the perfect time to do it while they're still dormant. Um, so that's kind of, kind of the stuff we'll, we'll have going on. Uh, you know, what kind of trees do you plant? Is that stuff that you are <laughs> like growing yourself out of acorns? Or are you buying trees? How's that work? Both. Um, so I go out in in the fall. I, I've always uh, kind of been, you know, intrigued by uh, by plants and uh, and trees, and so I've always kind of collected acorns and like to watch them grow. Um, that it's kind of spread since then. Once we once we got this property and and had a place to plant stuff, and one of the first things we did was we bought a bunch of fruit trees to plant on the edges of some of our food plots because, you know, we're looking for any way, any way to set yourself apart from the surrounding property. Uh, so all the fruit trees, which is your lease. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Right. Correct. So, uh, but you know, um, that's for anybody, you know, uh, if you think about it, a tree and, and especially a lot of these, a lot of these tree species that are either like heirloom, uh, like like old homestead varieties, or they're varieties that are um, quotations grown for wildlife. Uh, these trees were usually picked for a reason, typically because they're more disease resistant and more hardy than some of the other varieties. So um, you can kind of plant some of these things and, and give them very little very little attention. Uh, you know, it's not like a, not like an apple variety from an orchard where they're growing them commercially and it has to be sprayed every week with, you know, to keep the parasites and stuff off. We're not really, it's not really like that. So I plan, uh, I've, I plan it all, all types of varieties of, of pears, plums, apples, crab apples, honey locust, chestnut, um, persimmon. Uh, I've got hundreds of trees on my property. It's, it, it's crazy. And, and through that, I have, uh, got into growing them here at my house. I've, I've got kind of like a mini nursery in my backyard. Um, I grow, you know, a lot of stuff from seed every year. I, I graft some trees, um, you know, and like I said earlier, you meet like-minded people. I've met people who through QDMA are kind of into this stuff like I am. And, you know, I've even, even traded some like I've got some of this tree and I'll trade you for some of your tree and then we'll graft them and we'll, you know, we have, uh, we have some of everything. So it's really, really a cool thing. Kind of its own little, own little entity that is, or this own little hobby I've created that has gone through this kind of habitat management stuff that, that I'm so into, but, uh, for anyone interested, uh, fruit trees are, are great for deer. Like they love to eat them. All right, it's, you're it de- definitely like a unique thing to uh, to be into with with deer hunting. Um, right, but I I can tell you're passionate about it. One other thing we know you're really passionate about is the wild turkey. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but uh, are you ready for turkey season? Are you going any special places to hunt? What what's your plans for turkey season coming up? Yeah, I am. Uh... I'm absolutely ready. You know, I, I tell a lot of people, um, I'm a, I'm really into deer and Turkey and, and deer kind of keeps me busy all year, but I kind of spend all year thinking about turkeys and, uh, it, it may just be maybe a, a deep South kind of thing, but, uh, Turkey season in, in Mississippi is kind of like religion. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, six or so weeks out of the year and it's just, it's, it's crazy. I, I love, love to spring turkey hunt. And a lot of the stuff that we do as far as habitat management stuff on our property is, is specifically for turkeys. Uh, but yeah, I'm, 
I'm pumped about it, especially this time of year when deer season's kind of winding down and, and typically, you know, we'll start seeing some strutting and hearing some gobbling in the next few weeks, um, even with it being cold. But uh, I'll be hunting quite a bit on my home farm in Mississippi, as usual, and probably a little bit at home in Louisiana. But uh, I will, I'm definitely making a trip down to South Florida in mid-March. That'll be fun. Try, hopefully get my first Osceola. And uh, we'll probably make a trip, uh, probably make – a trip or two to Texas, hunt down South Texas some with some buddies, and uh, and we'll see. If I'm lucky, I may have to find a spot to uh, go hunt a Merriam so I can pull off a, a season slam. Yeah, yeah. If you That'd pull the pretty sweet you, season, yeah. If you pull that off, you're definitely gonna have to get back in contact with us. I'd like to hear about that trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it goes anything like my deer season's gone, don't bet on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm I'm ready to put deer season in the rear view because uh, I feel about the same way, Kyle. Don't feel too bad. <laughs> yeah. So when you're coming down to Florida, do you have somewhere? Uh, are you hunting some private land uh, down here? Or are you going to be hunting public, or what's your plan there? Yeah, we're we're actually uh, we're hunting with an outfitter. Um, it was a group of a, a group of some family friends of ours had it set up and had some open spots. So my dad and I jumped in and. And honestly, I'm not even sure who we're going with. I just said, heck yeah, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> Osceola is uh, yes. So yeah. <laughs> right, right. So we're we're hunting down around Okeechobee somewhere. But uh, okay. uh, I'm excited about it. So Yeah, maybe be in some orange groves or something down there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a it's a it's a different country, uh different than what I'm used to hunting. And uh, anytime you can go on any time of hunt, any kind of hunting trip, it's uh, especially with uh, with friends and family friends, it's, it's usually a blast. You know, hunting camp is, you know, all the camaraderie and everything that goes into hunting camp is, is a big part of what makes hunting in general so much fun. Well, uh, just following you on social media, I know there's uh, one other thing you're pretty passionate about, and and that's uh, that's your food. So I wanted to ask you about. Uh, <laughs> your your best uh tree stand snacks before we get off the line with you right so you know i'm a uh i'm a proud disciple of the honey bun uh i love them <laughs> they're they're amazing and uh you know in fact on a, on a spring morning on a turkey hunt if i don't get a honey bun and a cup of coffee there's a chance that i don't even go out that day because you know it's bad <laughs> it's bad juju in my opinion but no i uh coffee you know i i bring coffee to the stand a lot mainly because i hunt a lot of all day sits during the rut or anytime i'm traveling uh i'm a fan of goldfish crackers i like bologna and cheese sandwiches uh that's about it it's so stuff that's stuff that i can eat that's kind of quiet because i don't want to be crunching and making a lot of noise in the woods <clears throat> or crinkling a lot of wrappers stuff like that yeah, bologna and cheese. I heard that one. I haven't heard that one yet. So that's a, yeah, that's a good one. Hey, it uh, it, you know, it it never goes bad. So there's no reason <laughs> yeah. to worry about it spoiling because there's no telling what's in it. But there are still delicious. putting mayo on it. That's right. It's been a long time since I had a bologna and cheese. I don't know, guys. <laughs> yeah, come on. This is the deep south. I mean, the <laughs> down south hunting podcast. Man, I married I a girl from California. Bologna and cheese. I'm married oh, from yeah. California. Yeah, we don't eat bologna here. Bologna's not allowed in your household, right? No, we're all organic, man. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, and we've already called out my my uh, lack of southern roots on on social media when when I didn't include the honey bun in a list, and I prefer oatmeal cream pies. Little Debbie herself called me out. So <laughs> oh, yeah, that was awesome. She got you, man. That was don't good. mess with Debbie. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Anyway, what what's your what's the social media in case anybody wants to follow you? Right, so I'm on Facebook at Kyle Bennett. I'm on Twitter, probably talking about honey buns at uh, <laughs> K Bennett sixteen. I'm on Instagram at K Bennett zero zero sixteen. So uh, y'all yeah, follow me on there. I don't know that I have anything great or insightful to say, but I try to keep the the hunting related stuff flowing on a regular basis. <clears throat> And I actually follow your music res- recommendations as well. They're always really good. Oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a huge music fan as well. Uh, usually, there's some playing in my house at all times. So, 
that, that's bound to happen. Well, this is fun having you on. I really appreciate it, Kyle. Yeah, Kyle, I had a good time. Yeah. Man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And and uh, one more thing before I go, uh, we talked about QDMA, but uh, 2018 is QDMA's 30th anniversary. The 2018 National Convention is going to be in, uh, I think it's in July, but it's going to be in New Orleans again where we had it last year. So anyone who's interested, I definitely recommend you check it out. It's going to be a, a absolutely great time. Great week. Uh, we had a lot of fun down there, right, guys? No doubt. Yeah, we had, had a great time and and learned a ton. Met yeah. a lot of cool people, like you were saying. Uh, I guess I guess just being at the convention, I can vouch for what you're saying with, you know, being around like-minded people. It's pretty cool. Right. All right. Well, good luck. Uh, good luck getting that uh, that slam this spring, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking <laughs> to you soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Good night. Hey, just want to give a big thanks to Kyle Bennett for joining us on the show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd go join up in our Facebook group. If you don't mind, hit that subscribe button, and we're out down south.